uh, I'd like to welcome everyone for uh, for participating in this uh, in this seminar. Uh, we're very happy that uh, that you're all here. So um, thank you, Victoria, for uh, for presenting uh, today, and uh, thanks uh, to to Thomas for uh, being willing to discuss uh, the paper. Thank you both very much, and uh, take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of the organizers uh, for this initiative and for including this paper in the program. I, I am very excited. Um, so this is uh, uh, this paper is called Security Signing Non-Exclusive Markets with Asymmetric Information and is joint work with Vladimir Azrian, who, as Kim mentioned, is uh, answering questions uh, on chat. The, what we do in this paper is to, to think of a classic problem in economics and finance, which is to think of how can an agent, such as a bank, raise funds from outside investors to exploit gains from trade, such as, for example, find finance uh, for new investment opportunities. A friction in, in sort of thinking of this question has been that in many situations, agents are privately informed about the quality of assets that they hold. And since Ackerlock, we know that when you have this sort of information sorry, asymmetries. Sorry for interrupting. I um, I don't see the slides, and I think the the other people are oh. also not seeing the slides. I didn't. I didn't share. I mean, I had shared them, but then some it, they were unshared. <laughs> so. Okay. Sorry for interrupting. Uh, no, no, thanks. So you know, when you have these uh, situations in which someone is trying to raise funds by uh, selling an asset, but they have private information about that asset, we know since Ackerlock that this type of information asymmetries can uh, destroy trade. A large literature has followed. Uh, in particular, there's a literature on how to optimally design securities backed by asset cash flows. And this literature tries to study market mechanisms that ameliorate these sort of information frictions. Um, a common finding in this literature is that when the seller has private information and needs to raise funds from uninformed investors, uh, what this uh, agent or seller could do is to retain some of the assets uh, or, or part of the asset on its cash flow. In particular, the best thing is to issue something that looks like a debt security backed by the asset cash flows and retain the remaining cash flows. Okay. Um, why, why is this a, a, a common result? Well, the key mechanism uh, here is that by retaining, meaning by not selling some asset cash flows, the, the agent is able to credibly transmit her information to the market. In other words, it's gonna be a situation if, if your asset was bad quality, you would prefer to sell it than to keep it on your balance sheet. So therefore by keeping a fraction or, or a particular um, levered equity uh, security on, on your balance sheet, this operates as a signaling or a screening device of the asset quality. Now, the assumption in this literature is that somehow this retention can be enforced. And, I, and this is what this paper uh, tries to think about. Implicitly, to be able to enforce some form of asset retention, either agents can commit to only trade with one investor, and therefore that investor knows that the agent is uh, retaining what is not sold to him, or that investors can observe all of the trades uh, that the, that the agent is doing. So therefore I can observe all of the trades and you know I could design contracts that then I punish you if you sell someone else or you know and so on. Um, in practice though, uh, both commitment or observation of, 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 um, of retentions require a lot of, of transparency and enforcement. Uh, what I want you to think is that if, if, if I am selling uh, a fraction of an asset and I'm keeping the remaining fraction on my balance sheet, if you are the buyer, you not only have to monitor that I keep that asset on my balance sheet, you should only monitor that I don't take other positions like CDS or derivatives that help me hedge that position, okay, over time until sort of this asset matures, for example. Um, you know, in the, in the present context, we think that the complexity of financial institutions and the opacity of many markets where you don't really know who is selling what, uh, put these assumptions into question. And this is sort of what, what motivates um, our paper. There's also some evidence that this issue of not knowing who is retaining uh, something has come up. So there's a recent paper by Ashcraft, Guri, and Kermani that they study uh, the commercial mortgage-backed securities pipeline. And what they argue is, or what they find, is that complex financial innovations like collateralized debt, collateralized debt obligations enabled informed parties in the CMBS pipeline 
to reduce their skin in the game in a way that was not observable to other market participants. Basically, they find evidence here of certain particular investors selling some of the, of the tranches they were supposed to hold without investors being able to notice this. There's also a famous case, the Abacus case, that was settled by Goldman in 2011. And you know this case is complicated, but it has to do with someone, in particular the Financial Guarantee Corporation, claiming that it had been deceived by Goldman into believing that Paulson & Co. would hold a particular security, let's say, long term, while instead it was helping select the assets and taking a short position. So, you know, while you thought your counterparty was long, your counterparty was actually shorting uh, this position. So these are just examples of situations in practice where you could, you could imagine that it was hard for some investors to observe the risk their counterparties uh, were absorbing on their, on their balance sheets. So motivated by this, in this paper, we revisit the classic problem of how to design asset-backed securities in the presence of information asymmetries. Uh, what, what we do that it's, it's novel is to think of this question in markets that are non-exclusive. And by this, what we mean is markets where no investor can exclude a seller from trading with other investors. Within this setting, uh, our goal is to understand what are the implications of this form of non-exclusivity for equilibrium allocations, how much funds are, uh, let's say, sellers be able, to, how much funds will they be able to, to get, uh, how much trade will there be and at which prices. And then we're going to think about what are the normative implications to see whether or not we should worry about uh, opacity that generates you know, this form of non-exclusivity. So the paper relates to a lot of literatures. I would say my view is that it connects the literature on security sign with asymmetric information with the literature non-exclusivity in markets uh, for lemons. Our contribution to the, to the literature on security sign in asymmetric information is to think about the design of securities, but in a world where you can issue different securities to different buyers without them being able to observe this. Okay, so in, non, in, in this particular type of non-exclusive settings, um, now, there is a literature that has thought of, um, of sort of a lemons market, an Akerlof model, where agents have assets or uh, that are divisible or non-divisible, and they are trading in non-exclusive markets. These are papers like Atar Mariotti and Salanier or Kurlat, 2013. In these papers, they do think of trade and pricing and collapse of markets, but they don't allow for optimal design of securities, okay? So basically think that you either have to trade a full asset or you're restricted to trading quantities, okay? And then of course, there's the literature non-exclusivity in insurance markets. Uh, this is a bit different than thinking about asset-backed securities. Now, there's um, also a literature of non-exclusivity in credit markets, which is a bit orthogonal to what we're doing here. This is a literature that is not focused on issues of asymmetric information, and that is mostly issued, uh, focused on the problem of dilution and commitment uh, that you might have when you're able to sort of get a loan from someone and then after that get a loan from someone else and, and that might create dilution for the first debt holders and so on here. We'll talk about, I'll talk about this next, but we're not going to have this, this, this problem of dilution because we're going to restrict the seller uh, not to be able to sell things it doesn't have. And basically, in, in, in this sense, uh, you know, we, we don't have anything to say to this literature. Our focus is on the interaction between non-exclusivity and asymmetric uh, information. Um, as we view the application of non-exclusivity to financial markets as related to something uh, of opacity and lack of transparency in trades or on risk exposures of balance sheets, then I'll connect some of our results to, uh, to the literature on the value of transparency in, in asset markets in particular to, to the literature of, uh, of the papers of Dan Gold, Gordon, and, and Holmstrom, okay? So, um, oh, I, I don't know if we said this before, but uh, it's okay if you have clarifying questions uh, uh, because I'll start now with the model. So if you have any, you know, if something is not clear, please uh, stop me. Okay, so it's a two period model. Zero, there are two periods, zero and one, and there are two sets of agents. There's one seller and n more than two buyers. Everyone is risk neutral, but here we're going to motivate gains from trade by assuming that the seller discounts future cash flows at a rate, uh, well, discounts future cash flows at delta less than one, 
Okay, so what this means is that if you have an asset that pays cash flows in period one, you want that asset to be in the hands of the buyer and not of the seller. Okay, so this is a sort of a standard way of generating trade. We could think of this as the seller has a very profitable opportunity now and not in the future and wants to bring uh, cash flows from the future to the present. The seller will be endowed with an asset that's based cash flows uh, X uh, that are random at T equal one. The buyers will have deep pockets, okay? And basically here in T equal one, the seller will want to raise funds by issuing securities backed by her asset cash flows, okay? Now, I said these cash flows are random. The particularly, we're going to see them distributed with some CDFG of theta. Here, theta will be the type of the asset or the type of the seller. Uh, here, they're equivalent, uh, which could be high or low, low quality. What's important is that the CDF um, has an associated PDF with full support, but most importantly, that we assume this monotone likelihood ratio property means, uh, what this means is that basically, if you observe a high cash flow, it's more likely to have come up from a good asset. Okay. In other words, the ratio of PDFs is increasing in cash flows X. Okay. So, um, how do we introduce asymmetric information? We're going to say the seller knows her asset type, okay, theta, but buyers are uninformed. They are going to have a prior belief, which we denote by mu zero, which is the probability that theta is equal to high to h okay that the type is high quality so uh we're going to uh focus on the issuance of uh what when i call the asset back securities uh i think of what it's what we call here feasible securities so what is a security so a security it's a function that maps from a cash flow realization to the real line with payoff f of x when their realization of cash flows is x, okay? This is what we mean by security. It's basically uh, a function of x. But we're going to constrain the seller to issue uh, securities that have the two following constraints. The first one is a capacity constraint, okay? A capacity constraint basically, or sometimes it's also called limited liability constraint. It means that buyers cannot uh, transfer at time zero cash flows to the seller. Uh, and most importantly, it means that um, all of the promises that the seller is making to buyers, which you could think here, it's the sum of all of the F that it issues, always have to be lower than X. So what this means is that you can never uh, issue cash flows you do not have, okay? I'll, I'll talk about this in a little bit. The second assumption that we make that is mostly for tractability and is uh, relatively standard in the security design literature is this weak monotonicity. We're going to focus on securities that are monotone and we're going to uh, restrict the cash flow to the seller to be also uh, monotone, okay? Without this weak monotonicity, here, it will be very hard to understand um, which security is better for which type, okay? So it gives us some sort of order. Um, so what I want to discuss more is the capacity constraint. Um, because this capacity constraint, some, sometimes it seems like it might conflict with this notion of non-exclusivity. Uh, the capacity constraint basically here rules out dilution, which is a problem that has, as I said, has been studied and, and we're not, uh, we, you know, we want to abstract from that. So dilution is not possible because you know once uh, you sell a cash flow you don't have it anymore. Um, so as I said, the seller cannot transfer cash flow she does not own. The way we interpret this within the non-exclusivity setting, it's that basically a buy as a buyer here you can verify trades made with you. Okay, so this is a transaction. Think of a of a um, of a di of a deposit or a transfer of cash, you do. No, you can you can you can um, in 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 the spot market for these particular cash flows, we can verify that these cash flows have been transferred to me. Therefore, these cash flows cannot be transferred to anyone else. Okay. However, even though you can verify transfers if you are in the transaction, you cannot observe the trades that a seller makes with other buyers. Okay. So in some sense, you should, we should think that this is, it relates to market anonymity, that there's no, or there's no market where I can observe all of the trades that you're entering into, okay? So I cannot observe um, 
yeah, the trades a seller makes with other buyers, okay? In the paper, we have a, the, um, an appendix with a small micro foundation that helps you think about both of these constraints in a non-exclusive uh, setting, because this is an interesting discussion and I'm happy to talk more uh, at the end also. Uh -huh. um, okay, so now let me get into the, the, the way the market actually operates. So we're gonna consider the following screening game. It's going to be a first stage in which buyers simultaneously post menus of contracts. What does this mean? Well, a menu, um, it's posted by buyer I, MI posted by buyer I, is a set of security price pairs. This security at this particular price, okay? So a menu could have, you know, lots of securities and at their corresponding price. There's a stage two in which uh, buyers observe the menus that are posted and can choose to withdraw their menu or exit the market at a small cost. And then the seller uh, observes the active menus, the menus that have not been withdrawn, and selects which securities to issue. Remember, subject to these constraints, that she cannot issue more than what she has, and that um, the securities she issues have to be monitored. Okay. So finally, all contracts are executed. Uh, buyer I will pay price I to the seller at time zero, and at equal one, it will receive FI of X. Uh, well, uh, at a real estate of X. Okay. I'll come back to this as the stage two. Which is, uh, so this is a relatively similar screening game. We have added this stage two to ensure existence, and I'll come back to this. Uh, here what's important is remember the buyer posts menus all the securities and the prices that uh, he's willing to buy. Uh, the same, if the buyers can choose to draw menus if they find them unprofitable, uh, they will make losses with these menus, and then the seller chooses which contracts to accept. Uh, in the non-exclusive setting, it can accept contracts from multiple buyers. Okay. So um, are not perfect data. Uh, it is, uh, so the seller uh, giving the menu contracts that are posted by buyers, a theta type seller, which is a seller with an asset quality theta, uh, accepts a physical set of contracts using respective data. Given this, um, so the buyers given the sellers and other strategies and posted menus, uh, choose which menus to post his stage one, and whether to withdraw or not, also to maximize his expected payoff. And then most importantly, beliefs have to be consistent. So buyers' beliefs about who is accepting a particular contract uh, are computed using the sellers and buy strategies and Basel. So let me start with two uh, benefits. Because here we we have two assumptions. One that we do friction, let's say there's asymmetric information. Another one is in the commitment that's not trade with our buyers. I'm going to do two benchmarks in which uh, I remove the assumption of one before we go to the non-exclusive aspect. So let's start with the benchmark of asymmetric, no asymmetric information. So here I'm going to show you it doesn't matter whether markets are exclusive or non-exclusive in a setting in which the buyers can observe the quality of the asset theta, then what happens? Well, here the gains from trade are maximized when the seller issues a full claim to her cash flows, meaning to her asset cash flow. So it sells the full asset. So the security here for all seller types is, is X, is basically equity, okay? You're selling all of the cash flows. As the buyer observes the, the asset quality and markets are competitive, then the price will be the expected value of that asset conditional on the full information, right? On the asset type. So therefore the seller's payoff here, it's very simple. It's just the expected value of the asset uh, conditional on type, okay? And what's important here is that we don't have a delta. So this is not discounted at a rate uh, at less by less than one. This is basically getting the highest value you could get for this asset, okay? This outcome happens with exclusive or non-exclusive markets in this setting, okay? So the, the important thing of this benchmark is to realize that without asymmetric information in this setting, non-exclusivity has no bite. Um, then let's think what happens when markets are exclusive. When we do have asymmetric information, but agents can commit, uh, the seller can commit to trade with only one buyer, okay? 
So here we show that an equilibrium always exists and it's unique. Uh, in particular, there exists some average quality, some threshold, such that when average quality is relatively low, the equilibrium features perfect separation. So there exists a dead level such that the high type issues a dead contract, which is priced at high type valuation. Okay, so she gets her full information payoff value of that of those cash flows. She retains the rest. And then the low type issues um, a full claim to her cash flows X and gets paid that at low valuation. Okay, this is what in the signaling security sign literature uh, with signaling, it's called the least costly separating equilibrium. Now here, and the reason why we get this, this uh, extra kick is that we have this withdrawal stage. There's also an equilibrium with cross subsidization when average quality is sufficiently high. Okay, so when average quality is sufficiently high, the equilibrium features some form of cross subsidization. The, the security issued is still a debt contract. The high type again will issue that debt contract. The main difference is that the price that this debt contract, sorry, it's higher than the separating one. Okay, so the, the high type is issuing more, but at a price below her full her her her, her valuation. While the low type always sells everything, but now gets a cross subsidy from the high type. Okay, so this is important. I'll come back to this when I compare it to the results in non-exclusive markets. But what we already see is that once you introduce um, asymmetric information in exclusive markets, there is a region where there's separation and types can be separated through retention. And then there's a region in which there is cross subsidization from the high to the low type. So basically, if, if you were to plot the securities implied by the exclusive market setting, here on the vertical axis, I plot the cash flows. These are the cash flows issued by the high type and the cash flows issued by the L type. On the bottom, we have X, the cash flow realization. So this is the 45 degree line would be issuing equity. Uh, so here, the high type is issuing a debt contract, which looks like this, okay? And uh, it's, um, the price will be at or below high type valuation. And uh, the low type issues equity, okay? Priced at or above uh, valuation. So what's important here is that these cash flows will be retained uh, by the high type um, in this equilibrium. So now we move to the non-exclusive markets where the seller can now accept contracts from multiple buyers, okay? And the objective of this paper is to try to understand the implications of, of, of introducing this, uh, this assumption or thinking that, that this is possible. The first important result is that once markets are non-exclusive, there must be always some level of cross subsidization from the high type to the L type seller. So markets are no longer able to separate high from good type assets, okay? Um, I can do sort of a sketch of the proof. It's actually very intuitive. Once you think that retention cannot be enforced, it seems natural that you shouldn't be able to separate through retention. Um, the way we prove this is, is as follows. This is just a sketch. But suppose that you had these separating contracts I showed you before, okay? So the debt contract for the high type, equity for the low type. Uh, and these contracts were offered in non-exclusive settings. Okay, let's say without loss of generality that buyer I is the one offering these contracts. Well, then another buyer J can deviate. It will offer two contracts in this deviation. One will be what they're going to call F and P hat, which is basically buying the cash flows, offering to buy the cash flows the high type is retaining, offering to buy those cash flows at a price slightly below low type valuation. Okay. Remember that the only reason why you're able to separate through retention is because the low type is not willing to retain cash flows on, on her balance sheet while the high type is willing. Now, if you give the option to, of the, to the L type of issuing those cash flows, okay, then the low type will always uh, want to accept the contract meant for the high type and then get rid of the retention with this deviating buyer, okay? In addition, when you deviate, you will offer a pooling contract, which is some contract that you have to pick very smartly, uh, priced at average valuation, slightly below average valuation. 
Now, as I said before, so with this first contract, what you do is the, 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 the low type seller immediately says, oh, I don't have to retain anymore. I can just go and mimic the high type and then get rid of my retention with this, step, with this other buyer. This is great. Now, of course, here we have menu withdrawals. So what will happen? Well, then whoever was off, whichever seller was offering this contract for the high type that was priced at high valuation, now is making losses, okay? So these contracts, the menus with these contracts will be withdrawn. But this is why you also included this, this, this pooling contract, okay? These contracts are withdrawn and then you have a security that you design it such that after these contracts are withdrawn, they attract the H-type seller and the buyers make profits, okay? I think the important part from the intuition here is not so much this, this part of withdrawal and offering of a pooling contract. It's more if you're trying to enforce retention, someone has incentives to deviate to allow the low type to get rid of that retention. Okay. And this is what non exclusivity basically allows the seller to do. You can enter sort of hidden trades where you can sell uh, retention or what you're supposed to retain. Okay. So this is the first uh, result. Um, the second result is that uh, in non-exclusive markets, there always exists an equilibrium, like the one I'm going to describe now, which we call the star equilibrium. This is an equilibrium in which the high type seller issues a debt contract, we now we call a senior tranche, okay? Uh, again, it's, it's the debt standard debt contract, but it issues this at average valuation, okay? Um, and we'll see why. This debt level, it's definitely positive. So there's always trade uh, and it could be equity if average quality is sufficiently high. So it could be that, you know, you sell everything in this equilibrium at average quality. What does the low type do? Well, the low type also tranches her cash flows. She will issue the senior tranche where she will get sort of a subsidy because this is priced at average valuation and then also issues a junior tranche to another buyer. Okay, so now we have two tranches that are traded. We have a senior tranche that is traded by everyone and we have a junior tranche only traded by the low type. Um, I'll talk more about this equilibrium, but moreover, this star equilibrium provides a lower bound on each seller type's equilibrium payoff. So if there is another equilibrium in non-exclusive markets, it will have payoffs uh, higher than the ones implied by the star equilibrium for both types. So what this means is that when markets are not exclusive, what you should observe is tranching of cash flows, a senior tranche priced at average valuation traded by everyone, and then junior tranche is only traded by bad types while this junior tranche is retained by good types. In this world, high types, if we observe retention, it, we shouldn't interpret it as a signaling device. It's simply that the high types think these, these junior tranches are very underpriced. They think the price is very low and they, they prefer to keep them on their balance sheet than to sell them, okay? So this is the world in which retention is never used uh, to, to screen or signal underlying quality. Let me discuss a little bit equilibrium existence and uniqueness in, in our setting. So here we have two important things that support equilibrium. One is the presence of latent contracts, okay? So these are contracts that are offered but are not traded in equilibrium. And in our particular case, need to be priced at low valuation, okay? So what this means basically is that the seller um, can always issue cash flows at low uh, valuation. Okay, the role of these latent contracts, which is relatively standard in non in non in in, in um, in non-exclusive market uh, equilibria in general. But in particular, in this setting, the role is to deter cream skimming deviations by buyers. It goes, it relates a little bit to the, to the proof I did for null separation. The idea is, well, here you can never cream scheme because the low type can always mimic whatever you intend for the high type and get rid of the rest uh, uh, because it's always a price at low valuation. So someone is willing to purchase these cash flows at low valuation. So these latent contracts are important. Uh, and then we introduce this stage two, which is also very important. This ensures the equilibrium existence both in exclusive and non-exclusive markets, okay? This is not something we came up with. This is known, this is the Miyazaki Wilson uh, in, a, in a, not in a game theoretic setting, but they realize that if buyers are willing to, in some sense, withdraw contracts that they find uh, non-profitable, then you can support equilibria uh, in screening games. 
And what this does is this deters deviations that are only profitable at the expense of active buyers making losses, okay? So sometimes in, this, in these settings, you might find deviations that are only profitable if you attract one type and another type uh, doesn't, doesn't mimic because he prefers to keep getting a subsidy from, from buyers. But this means that these are markets where buyers are making losses in expectations, but they cannot uh, do anything about it. So here we're just allowing buyers to withdraw uh, menus, at least in, in one stage. Okay, this is also formalized in a game theoretic setting in, in Netzer and, and, and Shewer uh, paper. <clears throat> now, our star equilibrium is not necessarily unique. It is unique if you think that uh, if we focus on settings where the sellers can always issue any set of cash flows at low valuation, I think this makes a lot of sense. I know this model is static, uh, but I think this is just saying, look, if there's always a buyer willing to buy whatever it is at the lowest possible price, then the star equilibrium is the unique equilibrium. But, if, but what we find is that other equilibria may exist if buyers coordinate on not posting a given set of latent contracts. So if we could have equilibrium which buyers say, okay, no one will ever purchase this particular set of cash flows at any price, then you can support other equilibria. And at the moment we're working on, on characterizing uh, those. Um, another thing that's important is that these star equilibrium, the allocations are very important. They're so important that the allocations of this star equilibrium have to be available to the seller in any equilibrium. So we show that even if in equilibrium something else is happening, it has to be that the sellers are always able to issue these securities, uh, meaning they're offered in some menu. Okay. In other words, if these things are not offered, you can show that there's always a profitable deviation for any equilibrium. So I have a few minutes left, so I'll, I'll move to the normative implications. Uh, we're interested in understanding the welfare properties uh, in exclusive versus non-exclusive markets. And for this, we need to think of payoffs to different seller types. So first, uh, we can write payoffs in the following way. So a high type uh, payoff, we, we can write it as, well, this is the full information payoff, the first best. Okay, this is what the, the seller would get in, in, the pre, in, in the absence of information asymmetries. And now there are two costs that this high type can face. One is a retention of cash flows. Some cash flows will not be sold and therefore you lose sort of this one minus delta. The second cost could be a subsidy that the high type has to pay the low type. So both in exclusive, or this, is, this could be true in both exclusive and non-exclusive. The difference will be the size of this retention and the, and the size of the cross subsidy, but you can always write it like this. So the first thing is to show that, well, of course, because we have information asymmetries, high types will never get their full information payoff or first base payoff. And the low types will always get at least or more than their full information, than their full information payoff. Why? Because they get the low types payoff and they might get a cross subsidy. What we show is that non-exclusive markets, and this is the, true for any equilibrium eh? from now on, uh, it could be true in any equilibrium, but in any equilibrium in non-exclusive markets, relative to the equilibrium in exclusive markets, you could have more or less liquidity, meaning you could have more or less retention, okay? For example, if we pick our star equilibrium, we know that if average quality is sufficiently high, there is more trade. The senior tranche of the non-exclusive markets is higher uh, than the one in exclusive markets. So there could be more or less liquid, but more, most importantly, non-exclusive markets always implement a higher cross subsidy. So when markets are non-exclusive, low types get always a higher rent, okay? Um, so why is this important? So let's think now of our notion of welfare. So here buyers break even, and we're gonna focus on ex-ante welfare. Ex-ante welfare is just the weighted average of the payoff of the high type and the low type by the fraction or probability of the agent being a high or a low type, okay? Um, well, we show a few things. Well, always the payoff to the high type is greater than the payoff to the low type, okay? This you can show it's true always. Uh, but most importantly, the high type gets a higher payoff in exclusive than in non-exclusive, while the low type gets a higher payoff in non-exclusive than in exclusive. This is not surprising, and it's coming from the fact that there's always a higher cross subsidy in non-exclusive markets. So non-exclusivity, it's always good for the bad types and bad for the good types. 
Now, what does this mean for welfare? Well, we remember we have this extended notion of welfare. And uh, what we show is that basically welfare only depends on the allocation of cash flows because here the prices are just transfers. So what this means is that when average quality is sufficiently high, non-exclusive markets implement higher welfare, okay, than exclusive markets, because they allow it to seller to issue more cash flows. When average quality is low, however, exclusive markets are better because they implement higher cash flows, okay? These are situations in which the seller benefits from separation, so it's better to give, to, to make markets, uh, let's say, very transparent, so that sellers can separate and sell more. Now, when average quality is sufficiently high, then actually this is costly. You would want, uh, you, you don't want uh, good types to separate. There's more trade when everyone pulls, okay? And then when average quality is very, very high here in both markets, everyone issues equity, there's no retention. So basically both markets are, are the same. I wanna highlight here the contrast with the notion of ignorance is bliss of, of several papers, but in particular in the Dan Holmstrom uh, and Gorton, this idea that usually uh, in markets with adverse selection, if you have opacity, this is good because it generates trade. And in this setting, this is only true if average quality is sufficiently high, okay? Here, if average quality is very low, uh, markets where there's no information and there's pooling actually implement less trade, okay? Now, of course, I was looking here at ex ante uh, welfare and then pricing is not important because it's just transfers from one agent to another. But non-exclusive markets do implement more cross subsidies and more mispricing of claims. And this could have very important implications in markets. In particular, they could have different implications for incentives for people to hold or produce good or bad assets. So we have this short extension uh, where we allow the seller ex ante to choose an effort, uh, exert effort Q at some cost C of Q to become a high type with probability Q. So here, the more effort she puts the, the more likely she gets a high quality asset. And, you know, it's very simple. Basically, uh, your incentives to, uh, to put effort are related to the payoff gap between holding a good and a bad asset. And because there is more mispricing in non-exclusive markets, this gap is always lower in non-exclusive markets, in any equilibrium in non-exclusive markets. So another result we think it's interesting is that when you endogenize asset quality, then the average quality of assets is always lower in non-exclusive markets than in exclusive markets, okay? So non-exclusivity harms incentives independently of whether it generates more or less retention. We have this notion, and I worked on papers uh, with this, where you, know, you always want more retention to generate more incentives, uh, ex ante. Well, this is not true. You should also care about pricing. And uh, what you want to avoid is scenarios where there's mispricing. If there's no mispricing, it doesn't matter whether you're retaining or not, okay? So um, how much? How many minutes do I have? Or uh, Let me see. So you have 10 minutes left. Ah, 10 minutes. I was rushing. I thought I, I, had, I was done. Okay, okay. So maybe I should have uh, taken more time. Sorry. Um, okay. So what, what this, so what does this mean? Let's take a step back. And especially now that I have uh, more time than I thought. So what we've shown is that non-exclusive markets prevent good quality issuers from separating, okay? And this is sometimes good when it generates more trade. Uh, and therefore in that case, it also generates more welfare. But this only happens when the first, the fraction or the perceived fraction of good assets in the economy or the market is relatively large. On the other hand, non-exclusive markets allow issuers with lower quality assets to mimic those with higher quality assets, okay? And this may have negative effects on the issuer's incentives to improve asset quality, okay? So when we want to think of policies related to financial market transparency, and there are some policies that actually are interested in, in, in uh, enforcing exclusivity of trades, what you want to, to understand is the trade-off between having more liquidity, in the case in which non-exclusive markets generate more liquidity, you face a trade-off between liquid non-exclusive markets with a relatively lower average quality or a higher average quality um, in exclusive markets, okay? There are situations in which exclusive markets are clearly better because they generate more trade and always have better quality, okay? But there are situations in which you do have a trade-off, okay? 
So what we do here is uh, we just do an example numerically and we parameterize two things. One is the gains from trade. So remember delta, a very low delta means the seller has lots of incentives to sell this asset, okay? So as on the bottom here, as this increases, the seller benefits uh, or welfare increases in, in the amount of cash flows that are transferred. And on the vertical axis, we parameterize the cost of effort by chi. So the higher chi is, the more costly it is in this economy to produce good assets, okay? What this is saying is that for a given level of gains from trade, exclusive markets uh, are better when the cost of effort is very high. So if these are markets where you, know, you think it's hard or, or the effort you have to put to generate good assets uh, is high, then exclusive markets may be better, okay? Because they will, in some sense, um, reward better those holding good assets. Um, however, when gains from trade are very large, and the cost of effort is relatively low, <coughs> non-exclusive markets are better. These are situations in which you're willing to sacrifice a little bit of the average quality, or maybe it's not so costly to produce good assets. And what, why are they better? Because they allow for more trade, okay? Uh, so non-exclusive markets are better where cost of exerting effort to good, good assets is relatively low or where gains from trade are relatively large. The model also has positive implications that relate to some empirical observations in, in, in markets, particularly in markets for mortgage-backed securities. Um, it predicts that, uh, you know, in, in the real world, I don't think we have exclusive or non-exclusive markets. I think we should think about how easy or hard it is to enforce some sort of exclusivity in contracts. Um, so as exclusivity becomes harder to enforce, uh, one thing is that we should observe the practice of splitting cash flows into tranches that are sold separately in markets. Uh, this practice should become more prevalent. Um, the amount of junior tranche retention should become less predictive of differential pricing in the market for senior tranches, but it should still be predictive of differential quality for those tranches. So what this means is that here retention is not going to operate as a signaling device. So we shouldn't observe necessarily retention, you know, um, if, 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 if an agent or if a particular um, asset uh, back security is such that the issuer is retaining the junior tranche, this should not affect the price of the senior tranche, but it should predict uh, that it's worth quality, okay? And of course, the quality of assets should also fall as exclusivity becomes harder to enforce. So predictions one and two uh, are consistent with evidence in Ashcraft, Guria, and Kermani. In particular, I want to highlight point two because it's not intuitive and it's not something you can explain with most models that we have uh, of security sign, which is that retention should not be associated with better pricing, but should predict quality, okay? This, uh, we believe our, uh, this non-exclusive setting, uh, it's, it's good at explaining this fact. Um, and then of course, there's a lot of evidence that the more of the, of the development of these uh, complex asset back securities, the, the, the fall in the quality of the underlying uh, mortgages. Okay, so I'll conclude. Um, so in this paper, we revisit a classic problem of security design with asymmetric information, uh, where we study the role of non-exclusivity. And what we argue is that non-exclusivity captures well some forms of opacity complexity of modern day financial markets. We don't believe that this paper applies to everything. We believe it applies for settings in which really you should think that when, you tr when someone trades with a particular buyer, that buyer has a hard time enforcing what the seller does with other buyers or with other investors, okay? So something related to, uh, you know, complex balance sheets or opaque markets, anonymous markets, over-the-counter markets, uh, I think it's an important uh, part of this. Uh, it's still work in progress, and our goal is to continue exploring the, the positive and the normative implications, and especially relate them to recent transparency-enhancing uh, policy reforms. So we're very much looking forward to Thomas discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Victoria. Uh, Thomas, you have uh, 15 minutes for the discussion. So we should be able to change the, the, the slides. 
Um, perfect. Okay, great. All right. Well, thank you for the, uh, giving me a chance to discuss this paper. Um, if you have any um, technical problems you see in my presentation, please uh, please uh, uh, shout it, shout out to me so I don't uh, advance slides which uh, I think are advancing but actually aren't. Um, this is an interesting paper to me, and it, it actually one thing I, as well as being a wonderful paper, um, one thing I liked about it, it reminded me of my youth, because the, I remember studying these. Um, uh, models were uninformed agents post prices, Rothschild Stieglitz models as a graduate student and, and spending a lot of time on them. And so this kind of reminded me of that. Um, so I'm going to briefly discuss the paper's results. And then I'll just get, have, have, I just have some questions from the author since I'm sort of outside of the liquidity end of the security design world. I'm more in the investment, corporate investment end of security design. Uh, and uh, hopefully those, uh, my comments will be useful because maybe they would reflect the comments that someone else would have if they were um, also viewing it from an outsider's perspective. Okay, the first is that this is uh, just a brief background. This is a really classical question. Um, in the original models, you had the uninformed uh, side, uh, it could be buyers, sellers, but um, depending on how you set the model up, but uh, you had the uninformed fellows posting prices and you could only pick a single contract. So um, in a way that's exclusivity, but you could also say that you can only post one contract. It, it basically implies ex exclusivity. And then the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the informed agents uh, would then pick one of the contracts off of this menu. And as Victoria pointed out, the problem is when you don't have a separating equilibrium, if you have a pooling one, there's a sort of cream skimming problem uh, where uh, someone comes in with a contract that skims off the high type. And, uh, and that, uh, the, according to Rothschild and Stieglitz, that means we don't have an equilibrium, but we stop there. But um, a number of authors, um, uh, although Rothschild and Stieglitz didn't agree with these extensions, uh, decided uh, to extend the, uh, the analysis with things like anticipatory equilibria or reactive equilibria and things like that, where there's sort of a withdrawal stage, okay, where you can withdraw your offers or with Riley, you can add offers. Okay, okay, well, getting closer to the present, this, this paper actually follows an approach in Netzer and Schur, and it, uh, it prevents, pr permits the uninformed to offer a menu of contracts, uh, but, the, 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 uh, but in, in their setting, the informed uh, condition on their signal pick, one's, pick one contract, but there's a menu of contracts. So you have a, this non existence problem, uh, uh, and uh, it's resolved by a withdrawal stage of the game. Um, if you're an uninformed, if you're one of the uninformed fellows, you have a chance after seeing all the set of offers to withdraw all your offers or withdraw none of your offers. You can't cherry pick and withdraw some of your offers. Okay, and um, this, uh, it seems like their model is designed to support a particular allocation, which uh, I'm just gonna call the H-type preferred solution, but uh, it could also be called the Mizyaki Wilson solution. And uh, this solution has a property that it maximizes the high types informed welfare subject to the low type basically is getting fairly priced. Well, fairly, the, 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 it's kind of hard to say fairly priced here because there's a gain from trade, but the, 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 the buyer of the low type security is not making any profit. Uh, the low types actions are incentive compatible and the informed uh, agents ex, ex ante participation constraints are satisfied. So he could lose on one of the contracts and win on the other, but as long as he doesn't lose overall, that's fine. Okay, so I think of exclusion as meaning our seller can't choose co can choose contracts from only one buyer's menu. Uh, so I, I, as I'll talk about later, I don't think it has anything to do with commitment. Um, uh, and I think of non-exclusion as a case where the seller can choose from more than one buyer's menu. So uh, what, what happens here? Well, when you look at non-exclusionary contracting, uh, essentially, you get rid of the existence problem. You don't need anticipation. You don't need reaction. You don't need withdrawal stages. So instead of uh, non-existence, you get an exi existence problem, which is much the kind I'm much more familiar with because I usually work out models where the informed agent moves first. You get many equilibria. However, the aggregate outcomes are going to be highly circumscribed by the equilibrium conditions. And the, the, the uh, classic result is that in all these equilibria, the low type uh, gets to gets to uh, 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 
the uh, the um, lo the uh, low type will sell whatever they have. You know, they're, 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 there'll be no pooling where the low type uh, pools with the high type with the, with the high type and then restricts sales when the sales are advantageous to the low type. Okay. This paper looks at non-exclusionary contracting when buyers have deep pockets. So it's not like some of the other exclusionary models in finance where there's some kind of, we need a coalition of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of investors to actually pull down the issue. Uh, but everybody, if they want to, could. They use the uh, NNS game and they compare exclusionary and non-exclusionary contracts. Okay, so I have just a simple example. Suppose we just have two possible cash flows. The sellers come in two types, H and L. Uh, H is better than L. Uh, buyers, uh, buyers don't know, know uh, the prob these probabilities, but they have a prior, uh, and uh, they think that there's a one quarter chance that that the, that that the seller will be an H type. Okay, and the liquidity discount factor is three over four. Okay, so what might happen here? Uh, well. Um, the first observation, and the only reason I can draw this as a graph, because I, graphs restrict one to two dimensions, is that we know that the, the in this case, the low cash flow, the, the cash flow one is always going to be sold off. There's no asymmetric information about it. Everybody, uh, even low types, are sure to get one. So we can basically reduce the problem to choosing the difference between the, uh, the uh, S2 and S1. And uh, that basically uh, is going to have to be because of the monotonicity constraints, the number between zero and one, because that's the biggest difference there is between the two cash flows. And you can think of that as the Z tranche. Okay, so we have an A tranche, which is always sold off, and a Z tranche, uh, which sort of represents the uh, marginal um, the uh, marginal cash flow as we go from uh, the, the large cash flow to the to the small. Um, the H type to preferred solution is sustainable, uh, largely for the same reasons as in Netzer Insure in the exclusionary model. So it looks something like this. We, red is bad, and, uh, red is low, and, and blue, is, blue is high. So we essentially will get the high type here is going to sell off 20% uh, uh, of the Z tranche. And uh, he's going to sell it, sell it off here, here, here at, uh, at, uh, at, at, at his terms. You can see this, the dotted lines are the seller's uh, ISO profit lines and the solid lines are the, are the, are the, uh, are the, are the, are the, are the buyer's ISO utility lines, if you will. And so, and, and then uh, the, uh, the uh, bad type, uh, Mr. L is gonna sell everything. Okay, he's gonna, he, 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 he's gonna sell everything and we have a, a nice, uh, you know, Rothschild and Stieglitz separating equilibrium here. Um, and um, there's a separation and there's no, no, no mispricing. Okay, so th this is sort of the exclusionary case. And, the, and, and the, re the reason the low is actually not copying uh, the high is that if he does, he's gonna have to sell, not sell off hardly any of the Z tranche. And he really wants to get rid of the Z, the Z tranche given its inferior quality. So if we don't have exclusion, what happens is that we could have a bottom fishing buyer who, uh, who basically offers to buy everything and anything at the low price, uh, at the, at the, sorry, uh, uh, at, a, at a price below the, uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, the, um, the, uh, excuse me, at a, at a, at a, at a, at a price that is, uh, that, that is um, a hot, uh, that is uh, higher uh, then the low types uh, reservation for selling can, and, and it, but, it's, but, but still is low enough to make the buyer a profit. So that's the purple line here. So the, in, in, in this case, our low type will just copy the high type, pool with the high type. And, but then after that, our low type will then sell the rest of the tranche off uh, uh, to the bottom fisher. And we see that because of the, uh, the purple line is between the uh, dotted red line and the, and the solid red line that both parties are gaining from this uh, transaction. Okay, the price is, the, the, uh, price is low enough um, for the, for, for the uh, bottom fissure to make money and it's, and it's high enough uh, for, the, uh, for the low type to make uh, money. And obviously this is uh, not an equilibrium. This is a, a, counter, a counter to an equilibrium. So you essentially get collapse of the exclusive uh, equilibrium. So 
what happens after that? Well, if we if we if we if we if if we if we have this, basically, we know we can't get separating equilibria in this without mis, mis, mispricing, and that could have good or bad effects on liquidity. The good effect is that if we're in a pooling equilibrium, L is not fully liquidating, which is Pareto optimal. With respect, it's optimal for, for, for H to also fully, fully liquidate. Um, but in the, in the non-exclusionary case, L always fully liquidates. So we're now getting, and an, an, the world's a better place because we have more liquidation. Um, liquidation is good, and so uh, non-exclusion is beneficial. The bad case is it's an exclusionary equilibrium is separating. Um, we're going to get uh, uh, H selling some of the Z tranche, and L is still li liquidating his whole, his, his, all his Z tranche. So, uh, because of the mispricing caused by non exclusion, what's going to happen? Well, H won't s sell as much of the Z tranche, or maybe he won't sell any of it at all. Um, and L will still liquidate their, their uh, Z, Z, Z tranche. So there's no increased liquidation by L and there's less by H. Liquidation is Pareto optimal because the assets are more valuable in the hands of the, of the buyer than the seller and therefore it's exclusion is bad. So this will be an, this is using the same numbers. This is our non-exclusionary equilibrium. Uh, because of this mispricing, uh, the, in this case, the dotted blue line is the, is the, is the average is the, is the ISO average quality line. That's the, that's the break even line for the buyer given he conjectures that both types will issue given his priors. And we see that in this case, our, um, uh, in this case um, H doesn't want to issue any, sell any of the, the uh, Z, Z tranche because the price he wants is greater than what the buyer is willing to pay. Um, L, uh, is, L essentially is going, is the, uh, uh, optimal strategy, you know, in, in, in this case is to obviously he, he like he'll pool in a sense, he'll, he'll pool in selling the A tranche and then he'll just sell the rest of his, uh, his um, endowment at, at the correct price, which is the price conditioned on the type being L. So we get- I'm oh, sorry, I just want to mention you have five minutes uh, left. Okay, great. Okay, so, so this is a nice model and uh, I just have a couple of questions about it. Um, the first is that the pitch for the paper seems to be comparing exclusionary and non-exclusionary markets. And again, I'm outside the literature, so I came to this basically reading this paper and the paper's reference. Um, but it seems to me if, a, if you're going to sell it as, an, as a policy empirical implications, you need both regimes to be somewhat plausible. But all the papers I ran into um, basically say that exclusionary markets, they give example, they say exclusionary markets in the finance contrast context, I mean, competitive exclusionary markets like these, where there's more than one uh, agent who's willing to take the other side in the trade uh, are not very plausible. But of course, those are papers trying to motivate uh, papers writing about non-exclusionary contracting. Typically, the, the, so that's typically sort of the example. So if this is the pitch, I think you should provide some example or some example of enforcement mechanisms or some cases where we actually have exclusionary competitive financial markets. Um, so it was, now this is not the only way to pitch the paper. Uh, Hart, for instance, wrote a paper on the inalienability of human capital, but he wasn't trying to compare a slavery regime with a non-slavery regime and look at policy implications. He was saying, well, you know, well, this is the standard model is unrealistic we get better, you know, we, ours is more plausible and here's the reason why. But it would seem then you should, it would seem like you should spend more time comparing with the other non-exclusionary models of security issuance and kind of tell us what the differences are. There actually are a lot of differences, uh, but uh, a person who's, who, who sees these models is gonna say, well, you know, we, we have people who claim to have modeled non-exclusionary financial markets and security design. So, so, so you know, what, what is this, uh, how is this paper different? Okay, I would suggest you change your foil, uh, but if that's obviously up to you. It's more of a taste issue. Uh, essentially, the, all the complications in the model are basically to make sure the exclusionary model works uh, because that's the exclusionary cases where you need um, this uh, counter, this uh, withdrawal stage. Okay. Um, you would get exactly the same uh, 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 high type preferred equilibrium outcome if you just model the world where the seller moved first 
and use the D1 refinement. You'd get the H preferred solution, I'm almost sure, with a lot less fuss and game theoretic uh, uh, complication. Another possible foil, if you don't like the, inf the informed seller moving first, would be a monopsony model, uh, which is basically where you have one buyer posting prices. And um, that would give you somewhat different results in the sense the, uh, obviously the proceeds would be different because the, the, the monopsonists would extract rents, but you would still um, get the characteristics, uh, a lot of the, um, the um, a lot of the, um, it would still contrast greatly with the exclusionary model. And in some sense, monopsony, I can believe in more than competitive exclusion, because we have lots of stories like with John about, uh, about uh, captive, uh, uh, captive firms or captive uh, financial agents. And, lot, and many of the models in this literature deal with the, the monopsony case, although I like the first suggestion better. So simplify, I, this is, a, this is, a, this is a, how much time do I have? Um, one minute. Okay, well, I think I'll skip this one. I think there's some ways you can make some small technical changes to make the model simpler. So I'm not going to go over this in detail because I have just one minute. And um, a couple of things for an outsider, it's kind of hard to read the, um, the, some of the statements in the paper, um, like the acceptance strategy to be optimal given the menus of the, the remain active in stage two, then I immediately think, okay, we have a Bayesian game here because if I want to withdraw my menu, it depends upon whether you want to withdraw yours. And then so, okay, so exactly what does it mean? Um, uh, the, 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 that should probably be discussed in the paper. Exclusivity is kind of defined in a weird way in terms of commitment. But actually, even if contracts are things exclusive, you can contract with more than one buyer. That is, you trade with buyer one when the signal's L and you trade with buyer two when the signal's H. And it, and it's not a commitment because you can't make a commitment conditioned on a signal because that would be unenforceable. So if I tell Victoria that I have two types, G, which is generous, and S is stingy, and I commit whenever I'm a type G type, I wake up in the morning and find out which type I am, that I will give her all the money in my bank account. And I keep not doing it. I can always say, well, Gloria, I, I keep drawing uh, the S type. Uh, I'm keeping my commitment. OK, and um, also it would be nice to point out when the seller receives private information. If you read the model and work through it, it's pretty obvious, but you want him to receive his private information uh, before, he make his, before he chooses the menu. Uh, and then you can pick a time either before the menu is made up or after. That doesn't so much matter. Uh, but um, I would look at that. And finally, just, just I will simplify this. I didn't understand the micro-founded model, perhaps just the name. The paper is micro-founded. It's, it, is a, it is a micro model. And so I don't understand the, the need for uh, micro founding a micro founded model that's already micro founded. And it also, in some sense, is more reduced form. It features all these interesting things like infinitesimal agents, it's different information assumptions, you know, unobservable contracting, and is a much more reduced form than the actual micro founded model. So, if anything, you might say that the, the, the model in the baseline model is more is a micro foundation for the model in the appendix. So um, I didn't understand the point of it. Okay, well, I'm sorry if I took too much time. Thank you very much. And I hope you uh, found my comments at least marginally useful. Thank you so much uh, for a further discussion. Um, Victoria, maybe we can first uh, see if there's some questions from the audience and then answer to uh, Tom's questions. Does that work? Yeah, sure, that, that works as well. Uh, thank you, Thomas. I'll, I'll come back to, uh, to many of these points. Uh, thanks, that was great. Uh, so uh, if you have a question, feel free to, I think you have the right to unmute yourself. If not, just raise your hand and I um, can unmute you, I think. So Victoria, one question I have is in your welfare function, why are the buyers not represented feel free to answer um if you uh ah, okay yeah that one is short uh sorry i should have said that so buyers here uh, always break even so they 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 may they have their welfare is zero so okay. they are represented by the yeah very good i should have said that so i don't uh, feel free to unmute or raise your hand i don't see maybe in the meantime i can yeah uh, exactly that would be great answer some of thomas uh i'll start by the end Thank uh, you. As I, as I said, I, th I thought that was great. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that you have that view on the micro foundation. 
Um, it's interesting because the reason why we included that part, and I talked a little bit about that in the presentation, but just for everyone, at the end, we sort of try to show you how you can, uh, what assumptions do you need to have a framework where you can have things like capacity constraints, monotonicity constraints, and non-exclusivity. And the reason why we did this is because um, we've had people uh, literally telling us you need to microfound uh, how that can be possible because their view is if I cannot see what you're doing with others, how can I enforce a capacity constraint? Um, and, and we're trying to separate, there's something about spot market transactions and observability of other trades. We didn't think of this at the beginning, um, but it mostly there, uh, yeah, it's, if anything, it's a less general environment, but we're just trying to say, look, there is a world in which uh, all of these things can coexist. Um, but um, that was sort of uh, the point. Uh, thank you also for pointing out these things that we need to clarify. Like uh, it's true that the stage two were not very good uh, when we describe uh, what beliefs you have about others withdrawals. And so that, that's, that, that's very useful feedback. Um, I, I wanna say, uh, oh, and then also, I think it's very interesting that you think, because we do think that enforcement, so for example, we have regulation on cash flow retention, right? Um, so th th that is somehow being enforced or not, I don't know. Uh, but I think this is a fair point. Um, I, I do think we, we tend to think, oh, you could have policies, you know, by making things more, like if OTCs were public and everyone could see who is trading and what, I guess that that would be, uh, it might be easier to enforce, not necessarily exclusivity, but you could write contracts contingent on, on what you do. Uh, but yeah, the big problem with with exclusivity is that even if you put things in contracts, then you, you have to take these contracts to court and enforce and, and, and you know, so it is interesting that maybe, you know, is this the, the way we see markets or is this really, we think something that uh, policy can improve? Um, that's something we, we need to think uh, a bit more. Uh, and then um, one thing I want to highlight, we included the withdrawal stage because otherwise we also cannot show existence in non-exclusive markets. So the withdrawal stage, it's, um, and, and let me tell you, I can tell you a little bit. So. If, um, if you think of the Atar, Salani, and Mariotti paper, uh, the reason why they get existence is you have two things. You have these capacity constraints, which we also have. But then in equilibrium, either people are trading everything or trading zero, OK? Once you introduce security sign, the paper starts getting closer. They have also a 2014 paper where they sort of struggle and show how hard it is to support equilibria. Um, because you could, you could always find deviations of the sort because markets are non-exclusive. Someone could try and attract the high type to a contract and give a payment to the low type so that he stays on equilibrium menus. And uh, it wasn't so easy to rule out these type of deviations. So, that, you know, so in that sense, we started this paper without the withdrawal stage. Uh, we were pointed out that this type of deviations we were not considering exist and, and, and it's true. Um, so then we introduce withdrawal, which of course has the perk that we also get a full existence, you know, always existence in the exclusive. But you also have problems of non-exclusive, uh, of existence in non-exclusive games when uh, basically in the equilibrium, the capacity constraints are not hit uh, or when there are no capacity constraints, basically, because you can always sort of, you know, play with that uh, difference and give the low type some transfer so that he doesn't come. Um, so, uh, you know, and we've been thinking about this a lot. So, I mean, I'm happy to continue this conversation uh, because this is something where, uh, you know, this is the last version of the paper where we introduced the withdrawal stage. We didn't use to have the withdrawal stage. Um, I think that's sort of... Yeah, I, just just as, a, as, a, as a response. Yeah, I, I'm not sure, but but I, th I think you the other thing the thing I didn't mention I think you could simplify basically getting um, at least verifying um, necessary conditions for equilibria if you if you had a bigger contract set so I, I don't see why you restrict your contract set to just a finite number of offers so 
if I, I could I could no, have no, a no, we, don't, we don't restrict to a num to a finite number of offers actually our latent contracts it's a continuum of contract so maybe that wasn't clear I think this is something we also need to improve because I saw your comment on uh... yeah yeah, yeah. It, it, it seems like the, the, the you, had, you had a set of contracts that you offer each agent offers a set of contracts and then you index them Yes, 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 but uh, it could be it's a con it could be a continuum of contracts. Uh, oh, so okay. I think that's, uh, that's sloppy on our side because yeah, we we write the well, I guess what I don't remember now how we wrote, but we end up always using sums of i's. But uh, because in equilibrium you only have traded a finite, but no, no, the, the actually the latent contract is a continuum set of contracts priced at, at average uh, at low valuation. So uh, in that sense, our set of contracts relative to Ariot uh, Atar. Um, um, and Mariotti, it's richer because they focus on quanti on quantity contracts in some sense contracts that look like queue times and then we just allow for a richer space so uh, yeah but that we need yeah. to improve but, but I mean for example if someone posts if there's two agents who post a contract to buy everything at the to buy any security priced at the low types at the low types valuation Okay, then, then, then I don't see how you would, how you, it seems like you easily verify separation, right? I mean, the, the, no separation, right? Yes, right. that will be true, yes, yes. So, so I mean, so a lot of the results essentially are fairly simple to verify. Oh, yeah, yeah. So without withdrawal, the only equilibrium candidate is the one we, we proposed. There's right. nothing else without withdrawal, that's for sure. The problem is proving existence. Because from there, you could have a contract that um, offers the high type to sell a little less, sort of like a cream skimming contract. But on the side, you also give a payment to the low type uh, not to mimic. So it's, um, you know, it's, um, it's not like we haven't found the deviation. We can't, we can't rule out these type of deviations, which are the ones that uh, Atara and Salani and Mariotti discussed in their 2014 paper. Uh, so maybe we'll send you an email. I mean, maybe we can. Okay, keep... okay, all right, all right. This is, this is an interesting conversation for us to have. Um... We are actually out of time. So uh, maybe indeed it's best that we, uh, we can continue the, the, the conversation uh, after the seminar. So I, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Victoria and Tom for, uh, for their participation, for, for, the, for the presentation, for the discussion. Thank you so much. Um, and I'd also like to, to thank everyone for, for being part of this uh, seminar series. So all the participants I'd, I'd like to thank. And I hope to see everyone again in uh, one month, approximately, uh, when Lorenzo Breccher is uh, presenting his, uh, his work. So thank you so much and have, an, have a great afternoon.